Let, let me begin with, with uh, uh, this poet. Probably you may have heard of uh, Maya Angelou. She wrote this beautiful poem, I Still Rise. And I quote this in the context of today, even before as we read history, history wasn't always fair to, to us, to the actors and the players. Histories were written with with patterns behind and then uh, having certain interests and agenda. So people narrate stories according to their, their inclination, their interests. So it's, it's not always fair. And this challenge is even more uh, real today with social media, uh, things are going around. And we see how millions of people, communities, peoples are reduced to one or two descriptors. And due to the act of a very minute group of the people, Muslims often have been reduced to a single narrative, a single descriptor. Uh, the Malays often also reduced to having certain feature like the, the, the myth of the lazy uh, Malay, like uh, the, the father of uh, Pak Farid wrote a beautiful book on that myth of a uh, lazy Malay. So, so I want to share this quote. Um, she wrote, You may write me down in history with your bitter, twisted lies. You may trot me in the very dirt, but still, like dust, I'll rise. And I call you, I invite you to, uh, to read uh, this, this uh, beautiful poem by, 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 by Maya. What I intend to do is really, the, the, the main thesis, the main argument of my present, presentation today is, when, as we speak about encounters, we are first and foremost speaking about encounters of human beings. Yeah? This is about two human beings engaged in conversation, uh, public conflict and tension, but they are primarily human beings. It is not encounters of theologies and beliefs, but primarily it is an encounter of two fellow human beings. Human beings engage in human relations. So what, what I intend to do today is just because I've been asked to uh, say a bit about my tradition, what do uh, what do my traditions say about these encounters and about this human being? I say traditions because there's no single history, there's no single tradition in Islam. And for Muslims, it's, it's a rich tradition. Next, I will talk about the sources. What are the sources to inform me about these encounters? To understand the others. Yeah? Um, I then ask the question now, how then do I understand these sources? In order to understand these encounters, how, and I read, I refer to these sources, how do I understand these sources? How do I use these uh, sources? And finally, what's the way forward? What can we uh, practically do? Yeah? So at least we've got something um, practical to, uh, uh, to go home to do. We, 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 we have something practical to do, inshallah. Okay. I'll begin with this argument. And this is basically my main thesis or my main, my main argument in this, uh, in this 20 minutes or so of talk. That this story is first and foremost a story of human encounters. Encounters of religious communities are first and foremost encounters of human beings. And we see the, in these two great men. San Francis Assisi, as well as Sultan uh, uh, Malik Hamid. Human beings are engaged in human relations instead of encounters of theologies and beliefs. So at the center of these interactions and encounters is a person, is a human being with personhood, with certain identity. And it is to this basic ethical principle that we ought to found interfaith dialogues and relations. As we speak about interfaith, we need to found these interfaith dialogues on this basic, foundational, fundamental principle of humanity, on human dignity and sanctity of, of life. 
It's not a dialogue of theologists and beliefs per se, but primarily it is a dialogue between human beings. And that has to be the center and the principle of our, our dialogues and relationship. And then it is this human story that we need to give voice to, not just stories of power, empires, uh, or empires and power, but human stories that we need to give voice to. I'll share a bit uh, in, ter in terms of uh, our sources later. Yeah? So let's take from this 800 years, 2019, when uh, Francis Assisi and Sultan Malik Kamil met. This is meeting first and foremost between two human beings. Yeah, uh, it's not just meet. It's not a meeting of a sultan and and a priest, but meetings of two human beings who are concerned uh, for and concerned uh, with the, the 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 betterment of of humanity. Yeah, so. It's humanity first before religiosity. And it is that trust in God that St. Francis made that way, only with another companion. During, just imagine the, the, the context of the time, during the Crusades, and these two, some may call crazy, but these two made that way to uh, make an audience uh, with the Sultan. And this is only possible because there's this great trust in God as well as trust in humanity. Because he knows that he's meeting another human being. Yeah? So, with the idea of preserving human, human dignity. Let me then briefly look into uh, my, my, my tradition. What, what my traditions say about human dignity, about sanctity of uh, human life. I'll just refer first, traditionally we'll, we'll refer to the Quran and then we we'll look at the, the prophetic traditions. Yep. On, the, on, the, on the importance of the human dignity as well as the sanctity of human life. There's a verse in the Quran when Prophet Muhammad was asked, uh, what are you or who are you? And God asked him to say, that I am not but a man like you. I'm first and foremost a man, a human being like you. Yeah. It's important to, to, to assert and to establish that very fundamental identity that we are first human being, then later we are Muslim or Catholic, San Francisco, we are male or female, we are Chinese, Hokkien, Javanese, or whatever. But first, I'm only a man like you. However, to whom has been revealed that your God is one God, and so on. Yeah. The dignity of human life cannot be understated. This is another verse in the Quran that we have certainly honored the children of Adam, regardless of one's belief, race, color, and so on and so forth. We have certainly honored the children of Adam and carried them on land and sea and provided for them the good things and preferred them over much of what we have created with definite preference. Now that's that's these are just two examples, two verses. There are plenty more other verses in terms of the value of human life, the sanctity of human life, of human dignity. Um, let me just then refer to uh, some of the uh, stories in the, in the Prophet. There's this not so famous text, I, I must admit. I must admit, uh, among the, even the Muslim community, we, we, we enjoy texts uh, with regard to uh, it's a legal text, theological text, but text pertaining to social lives, how Prophet interacted, lived, and engaged in conversation, how our sages, our scholars interacted with the others, often untold. You know, we read about what they think about, uh, about laws, about theologies, about beliefs. 
uh, we, we don't usually talk about how they live, how they actually live, the lived realities they experience. Yeah. So in this case, uh, Prophet Muhammad, this is a, this is a text about uh, the story of a seeker. In, uh, in, in brief, there's this guy uh, from Medina who heard about, who, who was looking, searching for truth. And he disliked this idolism. He disliked people praying, worshipping idols. So he was in search for truth. Until he heard about this guy called Muhammad in Mecca. So he traveled, wanting to, uh, to, to, to meet uh, um, uh, Prophet Muhammad. So let me just read you the text. So he said here, So I sat on my right and went to him. The Messenger of Allah was at that time hiding as his people had made life hard for him. I adopted a friendly attitude towards the Meccans and thus managed to enter Mecca and go to him, the Holy Prophet. And I said to him, Who or what are you? The, the Arabic term is Man Nabi. It's not Man Nabi. It's, the question was, What? What are you? Not who are you, but what are you? He said, I'm a prophet of Allah. I again said, What is a prophet? This is important. And he said, I am a prophet in the sense that I have been sent by Allah. The guy asked again, what is that which we have been sent with? What is that first message? Imagine this one person in search for truth, asking you what is truth. And this is very instructive, very significant, very important. The first message that Prophet Muhammad shared. When asked what is prophecy, what is religion, what is the prophet, and he said, I have been sent to John Ties of relationship. Yeah. To bring people together. To strengthen kinship. And we'll see plenty of other, uh, 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 many of these examples. Yeah? So I have been sent to John Ties of relationship with kindness and affection, and to proclaim the oneness of Allah that nothing is to be associated with, with him. The person then said, who is with you in this, these beliefs and practices? He said, a free man and a slave. During that time, there were only two Muslims. A free man, a slave. It was Abu Bakr and Bilal. Yeah? So that, 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 there were only two Muslims then. He said, Abu Bakr and Bilal were there with his among those who had embraced Islam by the time. I said, I intend to follow you. So this seeker of truth said, I want to follow you, Muhammad. But he said, during these days, you will not be able to do so. Don't you see the hard conditions under which I, I and my people are living? They were oppressed. So he was saying to this guy, I don't think this is a good time for you to follow me. Yeah? Because we are under uh, uh, oppression. So you better go back to your people. And when you hear that I have been granted victory, you come to me. That's, that's a, a, one example of early conversation between prophet and a seeker of truth. My point is, religion as, as seen by Prophet Muhammad Wasallam during the early period is, is not just about theological debates. There wasn't such theological debate, but really about humanity, about, about preserving and uh, keeping the, the kinship ties among people. Yeah? <clears throat> there's, there's another story on, on the arrival in Medina. Uh, it, it is a long story. Again, the question of, um, uh, let, me, let me just uh, uh, read briefly. When the Prophet came to Al Medina, the people rushed to him and it was said, the message of Allah has come. The message of Allah has come. The message of Allah has come. I came with the people to see him. And when I saw his face clearly, I knew that this face was not the face of a liar. So what was the first message that Prophet Muhammad gave to, uh, to, to the people? The first thing I heard him say was when he said, Oh people, Afshir Salam, spread the greeting of Salam. Feed others, Atimu Ta'am. Uphold the ties of kinship, Wasil Al-Arham. And pray during the night when people are sleeping. Sallu bilail wa nasuniyam. And you will enter, enter paradise with salam, with peace. Tadkhul jannata with salam. The first few messages that Prophet Muhammad conveyed in Medina wasn't about theology. And all those 
arguments, theological arguments about God, the existence of a one God, and so on and so forth. It's about one spread salam, afshut salam. Feed others, aftimu ta'am. Uphold the ties of kinship. Silul arham. And pray during the night when people are sleeping. Salul bin nas wal nas niyam. And what will happen? And you will enter paradise with salam. These were the early messages about humanity. Yeah? It's about bringing human beings together. Not the theological debates, not the legal debates about, although often we, when we talk about religion, we tend to talk about theology and uh, the laws. Yeah? So we need to found our interfaith relationship, our engagement on this fundamental principle, namely on humanity. That we are human beings first. On the dignity of humanity, on the sanctity of life. Let me just move to the next sources, uh, to the next point on, on the sources. Now, how, how do I know? What, what informs, how, how do I know about uh, how do we engage and relate ourselves to, uh, with, with the others? Theological and legal texts traditionally will always refer to theological and legal texts. Okay? So how do we deal? And then, so therefore, we've, uh, we, we often hear about, uh, in, in our texts, uh, that the non-Muslims should dress in certain ways. They should live in certain places. You have this in our legal text. For example, in our legal text, it's uh, stated that non-Muslims should put on certain belt to distinguish them from the Muslims. And you cannot stay uh, anywhere higher than the Muslims. So... Um, if you imagine today in the HDB house, so if you really apply, <laughs> so the 17th floor, the 15th floor, they're they all Muslims, and the non-Muslim, level one, level two, level three. Honestly. Yeah, so uh, you, you have mountains, up the mountains, are, these, are, these are the Muslims, and below. So the, 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 the non-Muslims should not ride horses. They ride donkeys. So it's like the Muslims ride BMW, the, the, the non-Muslims ride, what could possibly be donkey? Uh, <laughs> I can't say proton, eh? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you, you do have such texts. You do, you do have such sayings and legal texts. Yeah, that, that's, that is possibly one source. But in order to understand the human relationship, we cannot go to theological texts, nor the legal texts. Yeah? But I, I'm, I'm calling us to, to also consider other sources like the social and institutional histories. And I give example like uh, Baitul Hikmah, the House of Wisdom. And we see how scholars of various religious background, uh, the Jews, Christians, they were all involved and actively involved in, uh, in, in, in Baitul Hikmah, the House of Wisdom in, in Baghdad. The Al-Majlis. Al-Majlis is an occasion where people of various background uh, would gather and engage in dialogue and conversation. Yeah? So it's not just in theological and legal texts, but read the social histories, institutions of various institutions. But again, this is also not my favorite source. Honestly, in, 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 in discussing, and that's, that's basically my area, interfaith engagement, I don't enjoy reading the theological texts nor these official histories. But it is the other sources which I will share. Biographies, Tarjuman. Yeah. See how people lived, the scholars. We look at lived realities rather than texts, rather than the normative texts. And here we discover texts, the applied texts, so to speak, yeah. in, the, in, in, the, in the form of daily interactions. Read biographies. It's tough. I remember working on, the, on, uh, on, on an article published in the... Uh, see, I, read, I don't remember where it was published. Uh, uh, so I, I, I was working on a project. To, uh, I asked this question in, uh, during the early days, the Battle of and the rest. 
uh, how were scholars, regardless of that background, working together? So I read page to page, cover to cover, 10 volumes of book. It's a, it's a book, it's a, a biographical book of 10 volumes. One is uh, in four volumes, the other one about, about five and a few other, cover to cover. And reading stories about these scholars. And here you find different history. It's unlike what is written in the, the legal and theological texts. Really see life, see religion in action, rather than just a normative text of, uh, of, of religion. But even more interesting, if I can uh, draw attention, is to read human stories of dialogue and life. I'll, I'll go that, uh, to that, and then literature, poems. Especially for the uh, oral community, like, say, like the, the Malay in this world, they don't have long, we, we, we don't write, we don't publish, we don't write long books. But we, we, we document our history as well as our religious beliefs in the form of proverbs, panton, sha'ir, hikayat. Right? Uh, these are great sources. When we least expect to see how people interact and live with each other through poems, through uh, to, to, to literature. I want to draw your attention to, to, to the next source. Human stories and dialogues of life. Where do we find this? Court documents. Really? Court documents. And then you discover, you will see that, hey, when you think that the Muslims uh, should live at higher land than the non-Muslims, it is not true. Because in that documents, you see conflicts among the people, right? And they were sharing walls. They, they were not just sharing the land, they were sharing walls, meaning this house belonged to a Muslim and the other uh, beside him where they, they shared a, a, a walls with a, a Jew or a Christian and so on and so forth. So in doc, court documents, you see human lives. Yes, it's not always pleasant, but it gives you a glimpse of social life. They lived together. They argued, yes. Uh, they, they, they have conflicts, yes. But they lived together. It's unlike what we see in the theological and legal texts. Yeah? You see also in letters and correspondence. And one of my favorite sources, really, the, as we speak about Egypt and during the 11th, 10th, 11th, and 12th century, this is a good source. The uh, Geniza documents. Uh, anyone heard about these documents? Have you heard of these Geniza documents? No? It's a huge, it's hundreds of thousands of manuscripts, letters, court documents, and it's a great history. Even we have a letter, I, I, I've, I've seen the letter uh, between a, a Jew businessman who was in Aceh, yeah? uh, writing to his family who, uh, who was in Egypt. And this is about distribution of wealth after the, 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 the will and so on and so forth. So you've got these people, Corresponding, exchanging letters, Aceh and, and Egypt. And all this you can find in Geniza documents. And in, in these Geniza documents in Egypt, you will find that when we think that the, the Jews need to dress in certain ways, certain dress, or Christians need to dress, uh, need to put on a certain dress, it is not the case. They all mix together, they speak the same language, they speak Arabic, they dress all equally. So much so, we do not. We are unable to make that this distinction between a Muslim and a Jew, because they were just equal in terms of how they, their, their, their image as well. This is hundreds of thousands of documents, but it, they give you really the lived realities. They really tell you how people interact as human beings, how they live together, and not just the theology, not just the, the law. But we don't read this often. We don't share these stories. So I think we need to share many of these human stories, especially as we engage in interfaith engagement. Yeah. Methodology. Let me move to the, uh, to the next point briefly. 
Now, as, as we read this text, we need to really understand the, 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 the context. Uh, you know, when, when, when you have that legal text stating about uh, uh, social and religious certification, the idea is really about identities, right? Then they do not have an IC to state whether you're Malay, Arab, you're CMIO, or... They, 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 they didn't have that. But we acknowledge, we, we, we accept the fact that we need to identify people for, for various reasons, taxes and so on and so forth. So one way to do that was how you dress, how you present yourself and so on. But that is not the only way. So we need to understand the purpose and the ways that can take different, different forms. So we need to understand the, 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 the context of, of the text and why, why these texts were written in such a way. Yeah? And then it is important to understand that there's no single narrative. This reductionism is really, really problematic. When we read, I mean, this claim about, well, my race, Muslim Jewish uh, uh, history, this claim about the Jews were treated well by the Muslims. Or some will argue that, no, the Jews were treated really, really bad by the Muslims. Now, both doesn't stand. It's too extreme of the, of the you know, because there are various histories depending on the place and time. There is no single narrative to this story of human relations and engagement. You cannot possibly describe and make one narrative to all this. I'll give you an example. This notion of Vimmi. It's, it's very, it's very, it's, it's in any legal text, in any theological text. They are not Vimmi. Vimmi means the prote protected people. They are the Christians, the Jews. Often referred to Christians and Jews. But along his history, we'll see that the, the, there were many other religious people included later. So traditionally, we understand we talk about the Vimmi. The protected people, we think about the Jews and the Christians. But no, the, the, it's not just the Jews and Christians. There were Zoroastrians, the Majus, and, and, and various others also included in this idea of Ahlul Dhimma, people, the protected people. Now, this is a standard text. In any legal text, you will, you will find this discussion about Ahlul Dhimma, how we treat them, their position, blah, 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 blah. Okay? Now, in our Malay legal text, you will also find that about the, the idea of Ahlul Dhimma. But was it practiced? When I looked at Aceh as the, 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 the most powerful Malay Sultanate, Islamic Sultanate uh, in, in this region, and during the, the most powerful Sultan, Sultan Iskandar Muda in the 17th century, look, look at the text, and it's not just, if you look at the legal text, the fact, yes, you can find that. But really in practice, Ahlul Dhimma was not practiced, was unknown in this region. People with various uh, beliefs were left to manage themselves. So I could not find really a, an evidence to point to me, to tell me that this notion of Ahl Zimma was indeed applied and practiced here in this region. Yeah. And then you also find the same. Go to the further west, Andalus, Spain, and then to the Malay Archipelago, we will find various sources and voices. There's no single narrative. And it's very dangerous to reduce and essentialize history to one or two events or even a, especially when this is the, the especially when this is written by the power. So this story about the Crusaders, whether this is a story of a lust for political expansion or the zeal for holy war, I don't know. Okay? Yes, the, the scholars, the fathers, the bishops, the religious people are involved. But whether this is a story of uh, zeal for holy war, or it's only a last for expansion, a political expansion. So when we read history, we go to the, the, the detailed text, then we will discover, hey, it's not always about religion. It's human beings, whether good or bad. Whether human beings vying for more power and extending my power, or human being as, it's, as, it's, uh, as a moral being. Yeah? 
So let me just end here. Uh, so way forward, what can I do? Let's talk about humanity first before religiosity. By so, I mean let's forge friendship, make friends. And I was talking with Janet and uh, uh, Friar a short while ago that uh, it's not about when we talk about interfaith, what's important is just to make sure that you have friends. Friends from various backgrounds, regardless of the religion. That has to be the, the basis. That was what happened between Francis and, and uh, Sultan Malik, right? He came with certain stereotypes, uh, understanding about the Muslims, but his experience sort of that friendship, that human relationships have changed his perspective of the others. So he went back home calling the Christian to be the Muslim subjects, quote unquote. And this is documented in history. Came with certain, came with the objective of converting Sultan Kamil, left the meeting by asserting and, and, and recognizing Sultan Kamil and the Muslims. And it's not just uh, 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 St. Francis, but also then later Frederick, uh, who was charged as, even some argued that he may be one of the Muslims, because he was so close, so friendly towards the Muslims. And this happened only after they, they met in person, forged relationship, engaged in that human conversation and, and relationship. Not as a commander, not as a sultan, but first and foremost as human beings. Okay? i leave you with some... Uh, uh, let me summarize. It's again encounters of human beings. Human beings engage in human relationship. I talk about, uh, about the traditions, the sources, methodology, and really way forward is humanity before religiosity. This is a story of Francis and Sultan Kamil. Sultan Kamil was likened to a gracious father who saved the trapped crusaders, visited them in their misery, heard their complaints, cared for their sick, and excelled and excel in all other noblemen with his wisdom. These Christians left Dimyab with this new understanding, appreciation of the others. In another, the Sultan was moved by such compassion toward us that for many days he freely revived and refreshed our whole multitude. Who could doubt that such kindness, mildness, and mercy proceeded from God? Yes, I want to believe that is divine uh, initiation. Those whose parents, sons and daughters, brothers and sisters, we killed with various tortures, whose property scattered, or, who, or whom we cast naked from their dwellings, refresh us with their own food as we were dying of hunger, although we were in their dominion and power. And so, with great sorrow and mourning, we left the poor of the earth. And according to our different nations, we suffered to our everlasting disgrace. This is only possible if you allow human beings to engage in such relationships. I begin with Maya, let me end with Maya uh, at the end of the, the, the poem. She wrote, You may shoot me with your words, you may cut me with your eyes, you may kill me with, with your hatefulness, but still, like air, I'll rise. Does my sexiness upset you? Does it come as a surprise that I dance like I've got diamonds at the meeting of my thighs? Out of the hearts of history's shame, I rise. Up from a past that is rooted in pain, I rise. I'm a black ocean, leaping and wide, welling and swelling, I bear in the tide. Leaving behind nights of terror and fear, I rise. Into a daybreak that is wondrously clear, I rise. 
bring the gifts that my ancestors gave. I am the dream and the hope of the slave. I rise, I rise, I rise, and thank you very much. <laughs>